of you for coming tonight. I know there's always many choices on any particular evening. And I'm going to do everything I can to share with you um, the most valuable information I've learned in the course of my professional life. Because while I'm going to present quite a bit of information, um, I've never believed in information alone being all that helpful. So I really uh, want this to be more of an experience. And I'm also hoping we'll have a little bit of time at the end for discussion or questions um, that might arise during the course of this. But first, let me just offer a, a brief thank you to Mate and to uh, Spiru Haret University and Alexandra and Pachamama Romania. There's always many hands and minds and hearts that go into putting an evening like this together. And uh, for everyone named or not who've been a part of making this happen, I just want to thank you uh, for this opportunity for us to come together. So, as you know, the topic tonight is imagination. But it's a form of very practical imagination. I'll be covering some philosophies, some theories, some my understanding about how it works, some myths and misconceptions that are often associated with it. But more than anything else, uh, it's about accessing um, potentials within us that have become dormant largely due to a cultural emphasis. But I'm going to be talking about a capacity that we all have that if we learn to access it on a more regular basis and blend it and integrate it with our rational cognitive mind, we have much more potential for living a fulfilling, purposeful life with depth and meaning. So tonight I'm hoping will be a kind of awakening, a reconnection, a kind of remembrance even for who we really are as human beings. I want tonight to be an invitation to you. And part of what we're going to look at is the way that miracles are commonplace. And I'll be pointing out what I mean by that, the miraculous a part of each moment, including this one. So this is a short poem or a quote by a poet some of you may know, 13th century Persian, Jalaluddin Rumi. And he says, there are two kinds of intelligence. One acquired as a child in school memorizes facts and concepts. But there's another kind of tablet, one already complete and preserved inside you, a spring overflowing its spring box, a freshness in the center of the chest. And that's what we're going to be exploring tonight, that spring box. What is it in the center of the chest that even in Persia in the 13th century this was being talked about? In indigenous cultures this is talked about. In some forms of psychology like Jung's collective unconscious, my understanding is the way to access things like that come through a form of the imagination. So consider these facts for a moment. This is one example of what I mean about miracles being commonplace. So right now, we're on this earth, this ball of mud, and we're traveling at more than 67,000 miles an hour. There are 8.7 million species on earth, perhaps, it's kind of hard to count, but that's an estimate. The universe has a hundred billion galaxies. Not stars, but whole systems, whole galaxies. 
And yet in this vastness, in this scientific facts, there's only one of each of us. There's only one me, there's only one you, and you. It's rather remarkable. It's really remarkable. And part of what I believe our responsibility is as human beings is to find our particular view into understanding life, into understanding what it means to be a human, and to share that with each other. Because since there's a unique history to each of us, we certainly have a lot in common as well. But what I want to emphasize here is there's only one way that you and you have come to understand life and understand what it means to live. And it's through our shared views that we can get closer to the truth. It's like all of us looking in through a slightly different window. And along these lines, astronomers tell us that we are literally made of recycled stardust. That the things that make up our body, the atoms, are the same things that are in our hands, as in the chair, as in the air. There's a tremendous unity that goes back to the very beginning of the universe. It's the early explosions that sent these particles into motion that evolved to where we are now. And you might be thinking, well, this is kind of interesting, but what's the point, since I was talking about being practical? And let me give you an example of how holding a very large perspective can be quite practical. And this is coming in the form of a story of a teacher and a student, a teaching story, that happens up on top of a mountain. So the teacher has a glass and scoops up a fresh glass of water from a mountain lake. And in it, he puts a heaping tablespoon of salt. And he stirs the salt around. And he asks the student to taste the water. So the student tastes it. And he spits it out. It's bitter. It's undrinkable. It's terrible. I can't stand it. So the teacher nods, and he takes another heaping tablespoon of salt, same amount of salt, puts it into the mountain lake, stirs the lake around, takes a fresh glass, scoops up the water, and says, we'll taste this. And the student says, it's wonderful, it's refreshing, it's nourishing. And the teacher says, the salt is the same amount whether it's in a glass, whether it's in the mountain lake. And it's like our suffering and like our struggles. If we hold it in a very tight perspective, if we have our blinders on, it can be quite bitter and unpalatable. If we hold our struggles in a larger context, in a more global perspective, maybe in the awe and mystery of what it means to really be here, things can really shift. And I'll give you another example, and this comes from my work in the hospitals that I think Alexandra mentioned. So I, I worked a lot with people with um, life-threatening illnesses or severe injuries that really changed their lives. And I'm thinking in particular of a young woman, I think she was maybe in her 30s, very healthy lifestyle, but for some reason, out of the blue, she got a cancer diagnosis. And it really stopped her in her tracks. Everything was called into question. And one of the things she said to me was, you know, before this, I got so wrapped up in, you know, how people were driving, or if my fingernail polish got chipped, or if dinner was late. And she says, now my priorities have shifted so much, and I'm awakened to the gratitude for each breath and what it means to have another day. 
and the relationships with the people that really matter to me is where I want to focus my, my best energy, even with work and all the other things we have to do. And the truth is, we may not all be thinking about it on a day-to-day -day basis, but we all have a terminal illness. Uh, mortality is still 100% at this point. And so keeping a certain awareness of that can help us stay appreciative of the things that are so easy to overlook if we're only aware of the pressures and responsibilities of day-to-day -day life. So when you hear the word imagination, sometimes you think of a fantasy or going away from reality. Let's just go daydream. And sometimes that's true. That's one form. But it's not what I'm here to talk about tonight. I'm using this word to talk about getting in touch with more of reality, not less. And you might think of the very tip of the iceberg as being the things that we tend to be aware of, things that are available to our cognitive mind, um, rationalizing, uh, processing information through our senses. And that's great. I want to keep that part of me as healthy and active for as long as possible. But if that's all we're in touch with, we're missing a lot. And the kind of imagination I'm talking about puts us in touch with these things that are below the surface. And this goes by many, many names. Because, again, this part of us is as old as humanity. It's been called intuition. It's been called the wisdom of the heart. It's been called in some Eastern traditions the Akashic Records, similar to Jung's concept of the collective unconscious. In some traditions, it's <coughs> referred to as listening to the still, small voice within that carries truth. In indigenous cultures, it's talked about as being in touch with what they refer to as original instructions that we come in, kind of like that Rumi poem, we come in with information about what it really means to be human. And that's what I'm talking about, about getting back in touch with that. And you know, this might seem like the domain of spirituality and psychology, maybe the arts, but let me give you a quote by one of the most well-known scientists who speaks about this. Albert Einstein, and he says, the intellect has little to do on the road to discovery. The really valuable thing is intuition. There comes a leap in consciousness, call it intuition or what you will, and the solution comes to you and you don't know how or why. There's no logical way to the discovery of these elemental laws. There is only the way of intuition, which is helped by a feeling for the order lying beneath appearance. That's what we're talking about, the order that lies beneath appearance. Here's another quote of his that says it in a slightly different way. The intuitive mind is a sacred gift, and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. And as we go along, I'm going to talk about some of the ways I think this is playing out in our culture. Um, but let me provide a little more background first. Um, one way I like to think of this is, um, you know, if we are in the journey of life and it's often a long and challenging journey, we can say, well, we're doing that on two legs, right? And if we have a fully active, a well-developed intellect, that's great. 
But what if the other leg was our intuition? Versus what has happened in our society is that it's like one leg has become really developed and kind of muscle bound, and the other leg has sort of atrophied. So it makes it harder. It makes it harder to go through life. And if you were in a big desert, you'd even be walking in circles. So the idea is just to not take down rationality, but to rebalance it. We're a society that has become out of balance. And there are just things that you cannot access through the rational mind that we can access in these other ways. So let me go to a couple more practical examples about why this would be important. So many times in our life, we're faced with big decisions. Maybe we have to change career or move, or we have to make a medical decision about a treatment. And it's really helpful to use our logical mind first. Make a list of pros and cons, what's good about this, not so good. Consult experts. But even in the medical world, you might have physicians giving you differing opinions. I think you should do that. No, you should really do this treatment. And there comes a point where we have to be more active participants. Take that information in, weigh it, and then go inside and allow your intuition to weigh in. Because when if we stick to the medical example, you can have two people of a similar age, similar health, same diagnosis, same treatment, and radically different outcomes. So what are those factors that lead to the radically different outcomes? It's not as simple as treating a disease, we're treating people. And what we bring to it and how we engage has significant consequences, really, in all aspects of our life. And let me uh, quote two more in the scientific world, because I think it's really helpful to kind of substantiate these ideas um, from that perspective, too. So Jonas Salk, who is credited with the, uh, creating the polio vaccine, said, intuition will tell the thinking mind where to look next. And Isaac Asimov, who's a biochemist, wrote, um, I suspect that very few significant discoveries are made by the pure technique of voluntary thought. I suspect that voluntary thought may possibly prepare the ground, if even that, but that the final thought, the real inspiration, comes when thinking is under involuntary control. So it's very similar to what Einstein said. The solution comes to you, but you don't quite know how. You don't quite know why. So how do we tap into this? What I call guided imagery, which is a cousin, very similar to things like hypnosis, or meditation, or contemplation, or visualization, has a map or an infrastructure to help guide you into this information. I'm not saying it's the only way, but it is a very reliable roadmap, and I want to be sharing some of with you tonight. Guided imagery is commonly referred to as a mind-body tool, a mind-body technique, but I think that's a little limiting. I would call it a mind-body, emotion, spirit, environmental tool, because the linkages that we can access with information are far more than even just the mind and body link. So I want to talk about some common misconceptions, because this is not a brand new thing. Some of you may have heard about this or tried it. There's different approaches, different styles. But there's some ways of thinking about it that sort of get in the way. And I want to go through a few of them. The first one is that guided imagery requires a rare state of consciousness. 
you know, that we'd have to be drumming for two hours in order to drop into a trance, and then maybe you can access this. And that's, there's some wonderful ways to do that, but that's not the case. This is something we use all the time, and I'm going to show you how. So I'm going to ask you a simple question and give you about 30 seconds to come up with the answer. And the question is, how many windows are in the house that you're living in now, or the home you're living in now? How many windows? So just take a moment to come up with the number. you whether or not you've got your final number but unless you recently remodeled or something or you know were under construction probably nobody just had a number pop in their head right your logical mind didn't go seven no what did you do you went on a little imagery journey you said okay let me look in the living room I guess I can count those all right I'm gonna walk down the hallway oh yeah there's that little one in the bathroom I can count that one Right? And we did it right away. No drumming, no breathing. Um, and uh, we can really develop that through some techniques we're going to learn. But I think this is important to recognize how natural it is. It's, we actually use this. I also say if anyone has ever worried, you've done imagery. Maybe not a really good kind, but think about it for a second. So you're worried about a meeting tomorrow or someone you have to talk to. What do you do? Oftentimes you imagine, oh gosh, what's it going to be like talking to that person? You know, what was it like the last time we talked? It wasn't that good. You know, and you, you picture those things or you remember them in some way. Your body starts reacting, right? If you really pay attention, your heart might go faster, blood pressure might go up. Maybe your palms get sweaty, maybe your neck gets tense. Because what we hold in our mind is translated physiologically. It connects to our emotions. That's that network we were talking about, right? Well, we can work with that. We don't have to just be sort of victims to what enters our mind and takes us off and running. Because if we were to intentionally say, I want to take a little time to calm down or release some stress, and we're going to do a version of this, we can picture a place that's really relaxing and soothing. And if we had the right equipment, we could measure a chemical change in our bloodstream. We could measure changes in our nervous system. It's just such a valuable tool that we um, unfortunately don't have in our education system. Um, that's essential to really living life fully. Okay. Another misconception, you have to learn to stop your thoughts before you can do imagery. And the reason I say this is a myth is it's similar to uh, classical meditation. You don't actually stop your thoughts. What you do is you practice how to not let them drag you around. <laughs> You let them pass by, you disengage from them, but they're still there, they're still going by. It's kind of like um, the ocean. If the surface of the ocean is choppy, like our thoughts, that's still going on if we dive down deep and we go down to where it's quieter and more still. So a more accurate way to say it is we're learning how to direct our awareness, but not stop our thoughts. We're just not going to pay them the same attention that we often do. Some people use visualization interchangeably with guided imagery, but I discourage that because um, in the same way that we have with our external world, we have eyes to see, ears to hear, nose to smell, taste, feel. We have a full array of ways to access our inner world as well. And 
It's the slight majority that does have a strong sense of inner vision, but because it's the slight majority, it's been generalized in a way so that if someone else has a strong sense of hearing or senses things in a different way, uh, they don't think they can do imagery. So what we do is we engage as many of those channels as we can, but all of them comprise imagery. And the other thing is when you did the window exercise a moment ago, it may or may not have been a crystal clear image, it may or may not have been like a movie, but it was probably clear enough to get what you were after. Because the goal here is not to do imagery better, it's that it's a bridge to useful information. So picturing the windows, it might have been vague, it might have been impressionistic, but it got you what you were after. And that's really what we're doing with imagery. This is kind of a controversial area in the field uh, because it's like, well, what's the best kind of guided imagery? Is it mind over matter? And what this is really referring to is some forms of imagery are scripted, and some you let the images arise from within you. You never quite know what it's going to be, and you explore it. And I definitely am going to be teaching you the second version. But let me say a little more about this. So in a scripted version, let's say you wanted to do that stress management tool. A guide would say, OK, you're walking along the beach and you hear the sound of the ocean, and you hear the seagulls, and you feel the, the breeze on your face. But there's a whole bunch of stuff about that. First, maybe you don't really relax at an ocean. Maybe an ocean's not the place you like to go. Maybe you had a really bad experience at the ocean when you were young. And so instead of being relaxing, it's going to be very triggering and potentially distressing. And it's virtually impossible for a guide or a therapist to know enough about you to design something that would be tailor-made. Um, and I'll give you another example of someone who used a non-scripted form. So I was working with a man who uh, was in treatment for cancer also. And he wanted to reframe or change his image for his own immune system strength. Um, and also for even receiving the chemotherapy. How could he befriend it and have it be working as an ally and not something that he uh, was fearful of and just uh, strengthen all the forms of medicine he was getting, internal and external. So I guided him through this process, which I'll talk more about, where the images bubble up from inside. And he ended up having... Um, an image of the running of the bulls that happened in Spain, because he had gone there to experience that when he was younger. And to him, it represented vigor and health and strength. And so in his own imagery, he was standing on a balcony waving a flag, and he could see these strong images moving through the narrow passageways like the veins in his body. And when he did that, he felt vitalized. He felt in touch with his own power. Now that's not one I would ever script, right? That's not one I would choose or would know to choose for him. And it even surprised him that that's what came to mind. But when we use this way of calling forth that which is meaningful to us, we are often surprised, but it ends up being a perfect fit. It's like um, going to a tailor to have clothes made versus picking something off the shelf and it may or may not really fit. Guided imagery, this is another myth. Guided imagery is for relaxing and forgetting about the difficulties of life. And I put it as a myth only because it's just one of the things you can use it for. It's great for stress management, actually. It's great to, to find our little respite. But it actually can help us resolve traumas that have lived with us our entire life, 
to deal with life-threatening illness, to, there's, there's a lot of studies, I'll, I'll actually quote a couple of them, where we can actually strengthen our immune system in a way that the cells can be measured medically as improving with using imagery. Um, uh, we can use it to get clarity with things that we're really wrestling with and don't feel like we have an answer for. So it's just to, important to know that the capacity of what we can use imagery for goes well beyond stress management. And the last one is you need to believe in the power of imagery for it to be effective. And that's not true. Um, now you can really resist it and say, I don't believe in this at all and just kind of block the process. That is possible. But in the same way that we called to mind those windows, that didn't take any big creed or you know, getting on the bandwagon. Because again, we're talking about a natural capacity. Here's another way to think about it. So let's say you go to the movies, and you go to a movie that's kind of an action-adventure film. So your logical mind can tell you uh, you know, this is fiction, it's not a true story, no one's getting hurt, this is, you know, this is just entertainment. But what's the experience? What makes it fun? Is that the images on the screen, just like the images in our mind, are impacting our physiology. So we see something happening, we know it's not true, but we gasp, or we get excited, and then we sigh. And we can ride along emotionally and physiologically, even though we know it's just a story. It's not even true. But it's, that's how it works. It's like images are the language that, that communicate internally. So whether we're watching it on a movie screen, or whether our eyes are closed and it's the images from within, it's affecting us quite deeply. So another way that I like to say it is that deep in every heart is a wellspring of wisdom. But I don't want you to take my word for it. Instead, what I'd like to do is take you through a brief experience and just to see what you might find. So we'll take maybe five minutes or so. And I'm going to encourage you, if you're willing, to um, maybe have your feet on the floor uh, be relaxed and comfortable, and then either close your eyes or allow them to have a soft focus, and just follow along with me um, as best you can. So as we start, just notice what you're aware of, and we'll be checking in again at the end. Are you intrigued or bored? Are you tense or fatigued? Are you excited? Just notice what you can about this moment, your relationship to it. of breathing in and breathing out. And if your mind wanders off to some other thought, just bring it back to your breath as often as you need to. that we breathe travels to every cell in our body. So let yourself feel that or imagine that, that the breath is bringing vitality and energy from the very top of your head down to the soles of your feet. 
It's almost as though your whole body was breathing. And I encourage you to really welcome in the breath. This is replenishing. It's like a form of nourishment. Often in day-to-day -day life, our breath shortens, so this is a chance to really deepen your breath. just as important is the breathing out. It's a cleansing breath. It's a releasing breath. So I'd like you to imagine that the next in-breath could rinse over your forehead and scalp, bringing fresh energy to that part of your body. And when you exhale, just help those areas soften with your awareness, with your breath. Just a little letting go if you feel any tightness or holding. Send the next breath with awareness to your eyes so that they're not only closed, but they're really resting. Maybe there's a way your eyes even float back a little bit. No longer needing to engage with the world. Bring your breath to your face and especially your jaw, soft and loose. into your neck and shoulders and upper back. It's one of those places a lot of us carry stress. You might want to feel as though you're slipping a heavy winter coat off your shoulders, letting it drop to the floor. And then let your breath be like an internal breeze that flows down into your arms and hands and fingers. And a little more subtle awareness as you bring your focus into your torso, letting the oxygen support all the different vital organs and even noticing there if there's anything that can be softer so that they feel natural and relaxed. Breathing down into your hips, your legs, that breeze of the breath all the way down to the soles of your feet. And see how many toes you can feel from the inside out. your body continues to enjoy the relaxation with each breath, bring your awareness to your mind. Feeling how expansive your mind is, like a big open field. And again, those thoughts may come and go, but just be more aware of the field through which they pass. wherever you sense that part of yourself. Same thing. You don't have to make anything happen, but just invite relaxation. Now I'd like to invite you to allow an image to form for a place, an environment, that would really encourage and support these relaxing feelings. This place could be indoor or outdoor. It could be familiar to you or imaginary. But whatever begins to form, really notice it. What are the colors you're most aware of? What about the textures? 
time of day does it seem to be? Are there sounds or a particular quality of silence? Are there any aromas, scents in the air? we did at the beginning, just check in with how you're feeling, how you're feeling in your body, your mind, your heart after these few minutes. And then when you're ready, you can open your eyes again. But I hope most of you, I didn't time it, but I bet it was under 10 minutes. I hope you felt how much of a shift can happen, even, even in a place like this. You know, fluorescent lights and everything else. So I'm not going to say too much more about the origins of guided imagery, other than it's been around as long as people. And the earliest findings that point to this go back to 13,000 BC to some caves in the south of France where they found, not these because they were too faint to have a good uh, picture of, but they depict a figure that's part animal, part human, that they believe was uh, a type of shamanistic practice uh, for healing which shares the roots with what we do with guided imagery today. So again, imagery is a little bit making a comeback in many fields. Um, let me give you a couple more statistics from just a couple of them. There were some very rigorous medical studies that were published in medical journals, traditional ones, where patients that were facing major surgery, and they did this with um, thoracic uh, chest heart surgery as well as abdominal surgery. And they compared the groups of those who prepared with imagery or those who just did a conventional approach. And they measured a 65% decrease in pain and anxiety in the imagery group. There was 33% fewer side effects resulting in less need for medication and a shorter hospital stay and an overall quality of ease to the experience. Let me also mention a little bit in sports, a lot of Olympic athletes use a type of imagery 
Because as we were learning, what our mind does, our body tends to follow. So there are sports imagery that are specific to the arrow going in the center of the target or the able to sustain over the course of a marathon. And I'll tell you uh, a study that was done with um, guys throwing baskets into the hoop, <laughs> free throws. So the first group just kind of was, didn't do anything. They were basketball players, but they were asked to take the period of time off while the study happened. The second group was asked to practice a half hour each day shooting hoops. The third group did only a half hour of imagery. <coughs> didn't touch the basketball, but just imagined it successfully going into the hoop each time for a half hour. And the fourth group did 15 minutes of each, 15 minutes of practice, 15 minutes of imagery. And the results were the group that did the best was the last one, one that combined imagery with practice. But what was surprising is that the second best group was the one that only did imagery versus practicing with the ball. Because there's something about aiming. What are we aiming for? What are the stories we're telling ourselves? And the ways that imagery actually trains our physiology. It's easy to see how this is in certain contemplative traditions. It's even making its way into leadership practices in some businesses. We talked a little bit about the benefits of tapping in for decision making, and even a little bit in education, which is really exciting. So how are we doing on time? I could do a case study, or I could keep going. Anyone? Alexandra, do you know the time? 7.35. 7.35, and we have until 8. Is that right? More or less. OK. Let me just tell you a little bit, um, another example, and this is a client that I worked with. And this is someone who was kind of reluctant to do guided imagery, um, but he had a heart attack, and um, his doctor said, well, this is one of the things you ought to be doing along with changing your diet and exercising is doing some stress management. And in the hospital where I was, guided imagery was the tool. So I want to just read a little bit about his progression with this and the ways that imagery can work on different levels. So I led him through a relaxation similar to what we did and then asked him to tune into his heart where he had had this problem and invite an image to arise and speak it out loud to me while his eyes were closed. And he said, my heart is tender and bruised with blue, purple, and pink patches. He says his heart feels battered. And this makes sense to him as he considers some recent surgery and the heart attack. He also describes his heart as having a weight to it, as if there's something heavy caught at the bottom. And I encourage him to continue, and like we did with the safe place, I said, if your heart had a voice or some way of expressing itself to you, what would it want you to know right now? There was a pause, and then emotions flashed across his face. His eyebrows rose, and he said in a gentle voice, the voice of his heart, I've been waiting a long time for you to come back. And then he tells me the story of his life. Uh, he was from an immigrant family, and there was a very strong work ethic that his father was promoting, had moved them to the United States. Uh, his father was a shopkeeper, worked very, very long hours, and with a lot of families, uh, wanted to instill this in his children and expected that Daniel would follow in these footsteps. But what Daniel came to learn as he kept tuning into the voice of his heart is that he realized that he was really wanting to be a landscape gardener. He loved plants, he loved gardening, 
It's what he wanted to do, but instead he had gone in more of a business direction, something similar to his father, something that certainly gained the family approval and the family legacy. And in working with his internal voice, the voice of his heart, he ended up making a career change. He ended up making that shift. But one of the things he did, and this was a long process, it didn't happen in one session, but over the course of working with him over time, is he found a stone from uh, one of the gardens that he loved, kind of like the botanical gardens here that I got to see. And he carried it with him for a while, and he put it in his pocket. And he offered gratitude in a silent way for all that his family did give him, and gratitude to his father. And then one day, when he was really ready to make the transition, he took this stone, and he placed it on his father's gravestone. His father had passed a few years earlier. And he expressed that he's giving his father's dream back to him so that there's more room in his own heart and his own life to follow his heart's desire. And I, I just find this such a beautiful story because while it started with the physical heart and the heart attack, it just so naturally layered into heart's desire and his passion for life and sifting out, as we all have to do through time, what are the things that have been instilled in us that work for us and what do we need to sort out so that we can live our own life authentically. So this is a way that imagery kind of moved into those deeper layers, which is not at all uncommon. Well, let me go back before that slide. <laughs> so I was saying that without our intuition or the source of wisdom within, in equal measure to our logical mind, it has made us a society out of balance. We've been walking lopsided through this world. And I bet we could name all kinds of things where this is true. There's social justice issues. There's income inequality. Um, there are ways we do not treat each other very well because we don't see each other through the lens of that sacred gift of life. And another way it's impacting in a dramatic way and in an urgent way is how all of these things have been uh, affecting our environment. What I say, the consequences of living without our whole brain or maybe even more accurately our whole being, our whole being. And this is an interesting way to get a quick snapshot of what's happening with climate change. So I'll just read through it. The Earth is 4.6 billion years old. And if you took that time frame and just condensed it to 46 years and kept everything in proportion, the human race has only been here for four hours. Out of those four hours, the Industrial Revolution began one minute ago. And in that one minute, we've destroyed half of our world's forests. Now, I'm actually not here to talk about climate change. I did a talk about that on Tuesday, although in the questions and answers, if there's an interest in more of the details, I'd be happy to tell you more about how that works and what some of the statistics are. But it, it really brings to light how um, vitally important it is not to just attend to these problems in a fix-it mode, which is fine if we do, but that it requires a deeper transformation. It requires us to not keep making the same mistakes, which I think is really possible if we re-engage more fully what it means to be human. Another way of saying it is, we can no longer be severed from our interconnection to all of life. Everything is in relationship. The food we eat, and where it comes from, and how it gets disposed of, and the industries that make our clothes, and how we get around in the world. It just, everything is in relationship to each other and to the earth. And guided imagery, tapping in, 
it is one of the really easy ways to feel moment to moment, day by day, our interconnected nature, how we're all in this together, how everything we touch and feel and think has impacts and impacts that are now coming back to us. So maybe the most simple way to say this, whether it's climate change or anything else that you have interest in, is that actions need to come from deep guidance. That we're still learning what it means to uphold this miracle that I talked about and the honor of being human. We're still finding out how to be human. And if we're able, again, if we're able to make this kind of a transformation, like a transformation that ripples out through co our collective consciousness, then a lot of the solutions will come naturally because we'll stop doing what we're doing based on our lack of awareness of this nature. Now, I just wanted to make a point that uh, when you do imagery, and especially if you do it a lot, um, pretty much everything feels very alive in imagery. Maybe even in the environments you went to, if you had an imagery come up in that experience, maybe you saw a beautiful tree, and the tree felt really vibrant, and you could feel its roots and its ancient nature and its majesty. Let's just say it was something like that. Well, after I was teaching and doing imagery a number of years, it suddenly struck me that how many magnificent trees am I walking past during the course of my day to go sit in a room and close my eyes and see a tree, <laughs> right? And I thought, well, what, what am I missing here? And I realized that, well, what are the qualities that allow internal imagery to happen? We get really present. We get really relaxed. We heighten our awareness. We're curious about what shows up. And we're open. We're open to the surprises of what might be there. So then I was like, well, what if we just apply that to all of our moments? What happens if we start moving through life that way? And sure enough, the trees outside are, in fact, quite magnificent and quite vibrant if we bring ourselves to them in that same kind of a state. So I've started calling that eyes open imagery. Imagery is everywhere. It's vital, it's alive, it's moving, it's available internally, and with a certain state of being, uh, it speaks to us in our environment as well. So I want to just close with a short poem that I wrote, and um, then we'll take a little time if there's interest in any discussion. Um, let me just find it. It's called Blessing for the Journey. When days rush past in a blur, may you pause to receive the simple gifts that life generously offers. When you are overwhelmed, may you rest in the gentleness of your own heart. When you are feeling hopeless, may your imagination hold a torch to unseen possibilities. When your mind is drowning in details, May spaciousness arise, connecting you to the sacred mystery that you are. When you are overcome with grief, may precious tears bathe your heart with salty buoyancy and comfort. When the world brushes you with harshness, may you realize we're all works in process and life itself is a learning curve. When nothing seems to be going your way, may you make room for the unknown, finding patience with your unfolding life. 
When you are disheartened by the suffering in the world, may you find the courage and strength to stand for what you know is good. When you believe you're not good enough, may you discover your inherent value and place in the family of all things. May you receive Earth's bounty to nourish your body, kindness to nourish your heart, wisdom to nourish your mind, and wonder to nourish your soul. Okay, well rather than just me talking away up here, I just want to open this up for comments, things you experienced, questions uh, of anything I touched on or, or related topics that came up in the process of this, or any, any other direction it might go. Yes? Um, can we find your poem online? Or <laughs> yes, um, I have a website. Oh, good. Hey, good cue here. <laughs> I forgot about the slide. So I have a website, and this poem is, there's one of the um, tags says blog, and it's on one of the blog posts. Uh, I will mention, I, I have a couple books here that are I brought for sale, and I discounted all of them from the full publisher's price. Two are on guided imagery. Um, this one, uh, Healing and Transformation, tells you more how to do this yourself, how to tune in uh, without a script and let the images bubble up and explore what they're saying, what they're meaning. The other one, Transformative Imagery, was actually created as a textbook, and I was the editor. So it's a series of articles from all across the field, imagery in medicine, imagery in sports, imagery working with veterans of war, imagery for pain management, it's, it's very comprehensive. And then the third one is uh, called um, Emotional Resiliency in the Era of Climate Change. And talking more specifically about bringing ourselves and our, our life back into balance as one of the internal solutions while we add the external solutions uh, in that area. Other questions? Yes? Is there any difference between uh, the guided imagery you just presented and the, the active imagination of Jung? Um, you know, I have a feeling that they're very similar. I'm not sure I am completely uh, versed in the nuances of Jung's version to be able to draw out distinctions. Um, but I do know, for example, um, he was able to name many archetypes that come up in imagery. And so what, what I would say about my approach is that uh, because I don't do much that's scripted, I wouldn't suggest we go to tap into a particular archetype, but I do know that they arise. So that, that might be one of the differences I'm aware of. It's the, this approach is so non-directed because it invests a huge amount of trust that what we all carry within us is whole and complete. So I don't feel like I have to teach anything. I just have to facilitate the process to come forward. Yes. Uh, hello. Hello. Could we use the, the, this technical imagery to talk with our emotions? We sure can. <laughs> and it can happen in different ways. Um, you know, for example, uh, a lot of people when they're feeling a strong emotion also feel it um, as a physical sensation. So they might have a tightness here or a weightiness in their heart or a clenching in their belly. So the way that would work if we were going to go that avenue, because when I work one-on-one, -on -one, uh, it can be even more powerful because spe people speak aloud with their eyes closed what the images are and then 
uh, we work a little more interactively. So I would guide someone through the relaxation like we did and the breath work. And then I would invite that person to bring their awareness right down into the sensation, wherever it's located. And to begin to describe it. How big is it? Where are the edges of that sensation? How deep in the body does it go? Um, is there a color that seems to match? Uh, does it move or is it static? Does it have a texture? Is it squeezing? You know, we really explore it in, in a very similar way that we explored the environment. What can we know about this from all the inner sensories? Uh, and then we give it a voice. What does it seem to be saying? What does it want or need? Can we provide that now? Um, so that would be one, one way of working with emotions. <laughs> <laughs>